Open University. Greetings, my speculative friends, from a secret location in the top of a building. It's actually quite Kafkaesque the way you get these old hallways with um, doctor's surgeries or kebab shops. And then at the top, a bit like a secretive law court, you'll get some Airbnb apartments. And so I'm now in an undisclosed location in Neukölln, talking from an Airbnb apartment. And I'm doing a sort of, um, what I've been doing in this whole series, which is a kind of unauthorized academia. Again, a bit Kafkaesque, because it's a sort of spread network of um, um, non-institutional lectures, which could be coming from anywhere and saying anything. So we're going to be talking about a guy today. I have to say that I missed yesterday a an interesting looking talk about um, design fiction, which is uh, was geared around the release of a new Sternberg book, an anthology, which maybe I can just talk you through because it looked super interesting actually. Um, it's got contributions from the late Umberto Eco, but also from um, Rick Poiner, who I worked with on Design Observer. And um, he he's um, they're talking about the, the role that fiction plays in designs, talking to specific designers about how their work is a kind of fiction. They've got experimental jet sets sketching a series of possible EP covers based on avant-garde movements from fictional countries. So you can see already that it's getting a little bit like um, what I've been doing in the Solution series with Ingo Nierman, which is looking at countries as kind of fictional design. Ingo started it really with um, this fantastic project called Redesign Deutschland, which looked at the um, scriptability, the rewritability of Germany as an idea. Um, there's also just now a really interesting exhibition at uh, NGBK in Kreuzberg called uh, Law as Fiction. So people looking at um, law as something rewritable, something very topical because Brexit, of course, is taking the whole of the European canon of law, the EU regulations, into British law and then starting to rewrite them. So it's opening up that. Uh, but there's, there's a nice video piece, for instance, in the NGBK exhibition in which uh, a divorce lawyer is looking at the divorce laws and then she suddenly picks up a pencil eraser and just rubs three clauses out and says, you know, I don't like these, let's rewrite them. And of course this is what's happening with law all the time. This is what legislative, legislative bodies are. They're actually um, fictional authors, in a sense, uh, writers, <clears throat> but kind of anonymous writers. They don't tend to um, because it, it seems to subjectifize and delegitimize um, law if you um, say it comes from the pen of so and so somebody. So they tend to be anonymous writers. Um, but this idea, basically, there's a long shadow being cast over a lot of um, contemporary art. I often say in these uh, talks that uh, I come to Europe to reset my watch to what the Europeans are thinking and what uh, is being talked about and thought about in capitals like Berlin, Paris, London. Um, in London I was particularly um, comforted, I guess, to see uh, the Barbican Japanese Houses exhibition and to have a, a scale model of Rui Nishizawa's uh, Moriyama House to walk through. <clears throat> of course I'd been to the site, I talked about this ten years ago, in Click Opera, went to see the Moriyama house and was even going to do a TV program in front of it. But it was actually really nice to see the English being introduced belatedly to this idea. Not that they can ever really realize the kind of spaces that uh, Moriyama has realized in his house because of planning regulations and because of the speculative nature of property in Britain. It's completely different from Japan where private property houses are seen as a kind of consumer durable which loses its value over time and which you therefore build for your own interests, your own sake. Um, but uh, I like the idea of them at least having this little glimpse of a poetic uh, Japanese living style. Um, and particularly interesting in that exhibition is the film by, um, by um, Ila Becker and Louise Lemoine, which looks at how, post-occupancy basically, looks at how the, the space has been lived in by the lodgers and by Mr. Moriyama himself. He's an amazing man, I think he's 70, 
something. Um, he listens to noise music in the basement of one of his little cubic blocks in that site. Um, a man I emailed a little bit with and uh, um, almost visited, but, but never actually did. Um, so I hope people like my brother, who lives right next door in the Barbican, gets a chance to see that exhibition and dream a little bit about Japan. And then again, it's a little bit of a taunt, um, because it's so near yet so far for British people. But I wanted to talk about the shadow cast by um, a theorist called Armin Avanesian. And he's the, the man associated largely with terms like accelerationism and uh, hyperstition and post-contemporary um, and all these sort of buzzwords which art students are likely to use. So it was a, my friends, the art students who invited me um, yesterday to this talk, which was held at the time and time-based media section of the UDK, the uh, University of Kunst here in Berlin. And... Um, I kind of have a very mixed reaction to these talks of theory. I, um, I kind of, I often identify a lot with certain ideas. You know, if you see it as a cornucopia overflowing with ideas, which you can pick from, pick a grape here or there, pick a, a piece of fruit. Um, <clears throat> it's fine, but if you see it as um, kind of jargon which is going to be employed for general well, for, for the next several years by art students and literary theorists and all the rest of it. It could be terribly tedious, but um, there are, there is a lot of overlaps, institutional overlaps between Avanesian and myself in that he's published by Sternberg. I have two books with Sternberg. My speculative fictions about Japan and Scotland, precisely. Um, he's writing for Spike and I just... Uh, reforged my bonds with Spike, the Vienna-based Austrian, the Austrian art magazine, which is actually now based here in, in Berlin. Um, Avanesian is also from Vienna. He's got that very noticeable Viennese twang to his German. Uh, speaks very good English, though. He's got a sort of sly and foxy face and um, um, comes really out of the same school as Mark Fisher in the sense that uh, there's a sort of cybernetic research unit which um, launched Mark Fisher and, and, and seemed almost attracted equally by right-wing and left-wing ideas initially, although Mark Fisher became a very left-wing thinker and Avanesian is also seen as a left-wing thinker. But there is this um, ambivalence at the very least about neoliberalism, for instance, which um, Avanesian says should not be seen as something to be destroyed but as a springboard. Again, I could almost come round to that post-populism, uh, post-Brexit, I could almost come round to that perspective and see things to forgive in the neoliberal era that we are emerging out of, possibly. Um, but let's look at his sort of buzz terms. Um, oh, also he's connected with, he's an editor, the chief editor at Merve, Merve Books, which is the, I guess the, the German equivalent of Pluto Press or something in Britain, you know, the, a serious, radical, philosophical press. Um, but really there isn't an equivalent because the Germans take these things more seriously than pretty much any other countries. So, and the House to Kultur und der Welt, who I'm here really now to uh, work with in early May, I'm going to be talking about their future. Um, one of the central ideas that uh, Avanesian is talking about is that the present is somehow devalued in the sense that we are um, defined as much or more by the past and by the future. The past and in the sense that everything now is post post this and post that, post contemporary, post internet, all that stuff. We, we define ourselves very much by how we differ from or, or, or have continuity with the past. Another reason I'm here is very much about my past. I'm putting together a compilation, so I'll be in a, not a compilation, a box set for Cherry Red of all the creation releases, which will be called Create and will come out in two bursts. Um, so I'm in a studio tonight listening to my old tracks from, from decades ago. Uh, that should be interesting me sort of defining myself a little bit with that. But um, Avanesian's central idea is that we're defined now, time has sort of reversed in a sense, that we're defined by the future uh, in various ways. And um, so I'm dressed today from a future where it's a little bit warmer. I'm sort of dressed for spring, although it's not really exactly spring out there yet. Um, but he's saying that there are things like algorithms, and he does have a tendency to talk about old things like 
Google services which no longer even exist. So if you look at uh, video lectures by him from a couple of years ago, you'll find that uh, he's talking about these things which <laughs> Google has dismantled since. Things move so quickly that his ideas are in danger of being accelerated out of existence. Um, but uh, he, yeah, he's basically saying algorithms, say Amazon's recommendations, predict our behavior. It's not just the old technology of video surveillance which looks at what we're doing in the present. It's um, how algorithms predict and markets, consumer experts, um, predict what we're going to be doing in the future. And the future, of course, is the realm of speculations, and it's the most scriptable of the three time zones, past, present, future. Obviously, the future, because it hasn't arrived yet, is something open to negotiation and to writing. So I guess you get into what he calls speculative poetics in this uh, in this area, uh, which which I, I like a lot. And obviously, my, my Sternberg books are very much about speculations about the future of, uh, of nations. Um, I also talk a little bit in my Un-America book about um, the um, speculative realism, which I have a slightly different sense of. Um, for me, it's um, there's a character, a, a Buddhist, a Buddha-like character who tries to talk about um, the future, uh, he, he, who imagines a likely history for, for instance, a pair of sports pants that you could buy in the store where they were manufactured, who who wore um, the next pair to be manufactured, and so on and so on. So, but. Um, Hyperstition. Hyperstition is another of these terms, actually coined, I think, by Nick Land, who was a colleague of, um, of, um, who, who came out of that cybernetic research unit. Um, so, uh, hyperstition is is kind of an updating of the idea of the meme, the cultural virus. Um, hyperstition is uh, a combination of um, the future of, of, of superstition and hyper. Um, the prefix hyper. So it's basically that you're, um, there are certain ideas which radicalize the present politically, philosophically, or, or in terms of populist memes. I mean, we're seeing very much the, the meme of Brexit, Frexit, Dexit, all this Nexit, whatever. Um, that's a meme, that's a hyperstition in a sense. It doesn't have to be based on anything factual, it's simply a sort of intellectual fashion which can wring great damage um, just by seeming to be current and fashionable and important at the time. People are very perplexed by um, the kind of rapidity, the acceleration at which these memes, these hyperstitions can undermine Apparently strong existing institutions, um, but this is something um, Simon Reynolds says that people see this as a sort of apocalyptic, um, uh, catastrophic change. But it's actually really anastrophic, and anastrophic means it's not the past coming apart, which is catastrophe; it's the future coming together. So again, it's the f the future, a possible future, determining the present, and we just don't know that future yet. And I, I guess what um, um, Avanesian is saying is that we should be more comfortable with the idea of um, speculating and creating fictions which have a chance at least of becoming not just hyperstitions but becoming new realities. Things which are not yet. This is the thing, the thing that I say on the front of the Book of Scotland is that every lie creates the parallel world in which it's true. And that's really, um, I think, very close to what they're talking about, that you can actually uh, script the future by creating it in advance as a fiction, which then can become accepted, then can become a fact. I was thinking about uh, the contrast between, and how, te how technologies have completely changed uh, the, um, the world we live in by the contrast between the inside of this building and the outside of the building. The outside of the building, you hear the traffic, which is obviously a sort of 20th century invention, cars, which are shortly to be re-scripted by computers because computers are going to be driving our cars, self-driving cars are the next thing. But also, because this is a heavily Turkish area, all the businesses here and all the people on the street outside basically are Turkish. That is uh, a product of the jet era 
affordable jet travel, also the Gestarbeiter thing, which happened in the 70s when the population of Germany began to decline and uh, outside workers were needed. So, But basically jet planes outside, cars and jet planes, transport revolutions, technology of transport determining what that street out there, the Hermannstrasse, is like. But inside here, we have this strange... Uh, um, uh, a post-internet organization of the building because the top floor here sort of unmarked doors um, very high-tech um, Airbnb uh, bookable by computer basically the product and limited by legislation um, especially here in Germany uh, because the government doesn't want this to really transform every single building they don't want Airbnb to define what buildings are in Berlin because they still want people to to live in a fairly traditional renter relationship with the city. Um, but yeah, these short-term fast turnover lets which um, Airbnb encourages, basically it's the computer reaching into the building and in a sense it's the future reaching into the building as well because this is the latest technology. Just as jet planes and cars outside changed the street there, this is what's happening to the inside of the buildings. So, um, yeah, that's... Uh, Oh, here's a, here's a comment. There are obviously a lot of sceptical people. I'm, I'm also sceptical, although I can see a lot of overlaps between what I've been doing. Jokes, for instance. I was just going to run through, actually, um, some of the things... Um, the latest book, because I, actually I, I blogged a thing recently about the covers of these books, because I kind of like the groovy graphic design. For instance, the latest um, Sternberg book by... Um, Avanesian is uh, called Overwrite and it's his critique of the academy, the traditional academy he's um, as was Mark Fisher uh, actually was a factor in Mark Fisher's suicide that he was very um, depressed in academia, in his jobs in teaching and felt that teaching had become consumerized, neoliberalized and uh, it was full of drudgery and depression basically a sort of institutionalized depression so Avanesian is very much on the same page as that so um, he talks, um, if, if I just read the contents page, for Overwrite, The Ethics of Knowledge, Poetics of Existence, his latest book. So part one, The Genealogy of Academic Morality, It's a Legitimate Crisis and a criti in Critical Legitimacy. Um, the contemporary university is defined by nostalgia, he says. Universal depression, research on the verge of a nervous breakdown. That's very relevant. Um, I think I always avoided... Uh, postgrad research because I knew it would be a, a place of terrible depression and I have friends just now who are going through this awful um, sense of isolation and depression trying to create their theses, get their doctorates in these very very narrow topics which nobody seems to give a damn about you know except for them and their tu and po possibly not even their tutors um, so and then Avanesian um, sees um, fetishism as an antidepressant in praise of conflict that's quite uh, quite interesting and, and also something that resonates with some of the things I've been saying in these talks that um, some weird sin might be a way out of um, this sort of desperate depression of um, trying to do the right thing. Othering the ego um, against local amnesia, uh, the formation of the self and speculative, speculative poetics, needs, demands, desire. I mean there is a certain language, a certain jargon already creeping in here uh, and this is something Pablo um, Larios uh, criticizes in, in a review in Freeze of uh, an exhibition a couple of years ago. He said, nested within this exhibition's vague title, um, which was about anonymous materials, uh, the subject of its well-padded symposium was the cluster of neo-materialist arguments known as speculative realism. The biggest flaw of these arguments is not the tediousness of their determinism, let's all read Fibonacci sequences in a potato peel, nor their poetic construal of philosophy, a fuzzy reading of Hegel, a cheap shot at Kant. Speculative realists apparently unaware of the irony of their own title tend, like self-replicating corrupted files, or like Enlightenment-era philosopher apothecaries, to find new ways of constructing old problems. Well, you know, what's wrong with that, you might say. True to form the exhibition theory... Um, complex here generated a new chain of illogical fallacies, branding the philosophical with the generational, the generational with the aesthetic, the aesthetic with the social, all under the bombast of a curious anonymity. 
it's no, no fault of the artist, but what did the resulting anonymous materials look like? Like seeing one's baggage dumped in, onto a flat earth by an airport customs official. Contents, vague masses, some humanoid semblances, but mostly jumble, heaps of stuff among mouthwash and receipts and dross. Um, just as enlightenment once led to barbarism, now theory leads to dogma, and dogma leads back to unenlightened conflict, now in high definition. Um, with fairness to Pablo, I, I think, you know, one does, on first exposure to a lot of these ideas, and especially their kind of curatorial, diluted versions in, in exhibitions, once they become a kind of new dogma, um, I think that um, Avanesian would probably argue that this, these... Um, rather meaningless clusters of uh, material might be the beginnings of some future um, sense that we just are not cottoning onto properly yet. And that's kind of the nice thing about contemporary art is that it's uh, a sense which doesn't yet make sense. Um, nice reference to Stop Making Sense, the, um, the uh, Jonathan Demme film, the Talking Heads concert from Jonathan Demme, of course, just died. Um, perhaps you could alter that phrase to... Um, start making new kinds of sense. So, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't go to the, um, to the talk because I was too busy reading Stefan Zweig. Um, also from Vienna, so the Viennese connection is still there. But, um, yeah, I'm kind of more, more interested in people a little bit out of time. I, I would really hate to start spouting this contemporary theory. I might appreciate the book jackets and I might be on the same page in a lot of senses, you know, with the same institutions behind me. But um, I'd rather be reading Stefan Zweig, who's a bit of a bodice-ripping, um, gallant writer. <clears throat> you would almost say a writer for women. Um, uh, he, was one, he was in the mid-20th century. Well, I, I mean, he died in 38. <clears throat> but um, in the 30s, the 20s and 30s, he was <clears throat> one of Europe's most popular writers. This, this one is particularly great, Amok. It's a real um, <clears throat> edge-of-the-seat page-turner, <clears throat> even if he read it in French, which I did, um, about a a doctor who um, becomes obsessed, passionately obsessed with a woman who needs an abortion, an English woman in Malaya, and um, who, who sets out to destroy her but then tries to save her unsuccessfully after a backstreet abortion. And it was made into an amazing 1934 film which you can see bits of on YouTube, and then later a 40s film as well. Um, very dramatic and uh, I, I kind of like Stefan Zweig's style a new writer, as far as I'm concerned, I hadn't read any Zweig. Um, but I like his style of uh, setting up a very dramatic situation which you want to see resolved somehow, but then putting in lots of purple prose and gallantry and kind of rather old world, rather 19th century kind of stuffing in between. But uh, I can see how he was popular and I can see how lots of films were made of his, his books. Okay, that's probably enough for today. Open University. Thank you.